What's up, everybody? This is the Booch, and welcome to episode nine of the Boochcast reviews Dark Side of the Ring. And this one, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be a fun one as we are going to be diving into the life and crimes of New Jack. And I have I've been waiting to do this one uh, outside of Gorgeous Gino. This is the other one that I thoroughly enjoy because. Uh, between watching this documentary and also uh, watching old classic ECW pay-per-views for the classic pay-per-view reviews we do on the podcast, to even recently looking at shoot interviews that New Jack has done, I have become a massive New Jack fan. I fucking love this guy. I love his ability to not give a fuck and his ability to put his body on the line to entertain. Like, this guy is amazing. At what he does. This dude epitomizes hardcore wrestling. He's someone who has a lot of love and respect for the business and is truly somebody that, someone who it takes great pride in being a hardcore wrestler. New Jack is somebody that you want to put on your list of people to study because he's truly amazing at what he does. Now, that being said, I'm going to put a little disclaimer here. Before I get started with this episode. Now, when I watched this documentary, I noticed there were a lot of moments in this documentary that were racist in nature. Obviously, New Jack tells the story of dealing with racism in the wrestling business from his time in Smoky Mountain to all the way up there. And there's a lot of moments where the N-word is said and also a lot of other racial things were said throughout the documentary. Now, those parts I realized were going to be hard for me to talk about because obviously I can sit here and say just the N-word and just say that, that and that's it without saying the actual word. I know I can do that, but I feel if I did do that, it would dumb down the emotion of the scene and it wouldn't do the promos or the story justice at the same time i also know that uh by saying the n-word it would upset some people obviously and i know there's a lot of black people who listen to this show and i don't want to make them uncomfortable uh with this episode i also know there's a lot of white people are going to be offended but i don't give a fuck about them because white people who get mad about racism to me are the most annoying fakest people in the world and they make it more about them than they do about actual racism so if a white person got offended, I'd tell them to eat a fucking dick. If a black person got offended, I would genuinely feel bad because I am not a racist person at all. And anybody that knows me, if you've known me longer than 10 seconds, you know I am not a racist person. So obviously, I find myself stuck in this situation because also, I don't want to violate uh, YouTube guidelines by saying the word. And I also have a personal opinion is I believe there's a big difference between saying the word and calling somebody the word. You know, calling somebody the N-word, is that's a fucking racist right there. That's a racist, stupid thing to do. Can't really talk your way out of that. But saying it like in a conversation or quoting something, I personally don't think that's racist. But I do know still that it will piss off YouTube and it will upset some people. So I want to try to avoid that. Because I'm a firm believer that context fucking matters more than the word. But I also know that we live in a society now where context is no longer important. All they do is hear a word and then white people just start crying like little fucking titty babies and it starts an unnecessary conversation that doesn't need to be had. So I thought, how do I rectify this situation? Well, here's what I did. Before I sat down here to make this video, I downloaded off of YouTube the Life and Crimes of New Jack, the full episode. I watched the full episode again on my movie maker and then I trimmed it down and I created this right here. This is a compilation of all the racist moments from Dark Side of the Ring, New Jack, Life and Crimes of New Jack. Now, don't bother looking this video up because I have it unlisted on YouTube and this, the second I'm done making this video, this video right here is coming down. So you're not going to see that compilation. Because I'm only using it to illustrate this point and tell the story better. I don't know if this is a reasonable substitute for people, but this is the best one that I'm going to do. So, that being said, we're going to jump up in this. Now, 
New Jack is by far one of the most controversial wrestlers on the planet. His heart, he has always had a razor or a taser or a staple gun in the ring. And nobody pushed the boundaries harder than New Jack. Nobody. This guy pushed envelopes. This guy jumped off of uh, 35 feet foot balconies in the past. Like 35 feet is the highest anyone's ever jumped in wrestling or done a dive off of. You know, obviously in WWE, the standard is 20 feet with Shane jumping off a 20 foot hell in a cell. But 35 feet is still the highest on record, I believe, by New Jack. Uh, unless, unless Shane McMahon did the one off the Titan Tron. I don't know how high that is. But like I said, New Jack jumped off a fucking balcony in ECW. So he says he has the highest jump on record. I don't know. Shane may give him a run for his money on that. I don't know. But extreme wrestling was popular because fans loved the reality of the violence. And New Jack blurred the line between real and scripted. Because some of his actions in the ring were criminal. And we're going to get into that throughout this, throughout this uh, video. Because New Jack didn't give a fuck who he hurt. And like I said, people love ECW. They love the extreme. They love the violence. They love it so much. A lot of modern wrestlers are trying to bring that into what they do today. And with some fans, it still registers. But with the majority of fans, it doesn't. Because with all due respect to ECW, at the end of the day... ECW was a trend. It was popular for the time period it was in, but it had a shelf life because eventually the people who were into that stuff eventually grew up and realized it was fucking stupid overall. Now, New Jack was a badass. Now, some say he was a bounty hunter. I found out later that was true. He was a bounty hunter. He did bounty hunting for about 10 years before he got into the wrestling business. Now, they don't tell you this in the documentary, but I saw an interview New Jack did with Vlad Entertainment, and he mentions that there. Now, some say he was a murderer with multiple homicides. That's not true. He's not a murderer. Uh, he has stabbed some motherfuckers, but he hasn't killed anyone. Uh, he was definitely a drug dealer. He did drugs, and he sold a couple, you know, um, in his heyday. And also when he was heavy into drugs in, you know, his ECW days. And he's, I think he still does drugs today. Um, Jerome Young is New Jack's real name, and he got his name from the movie New Jack City. That's where he got the idea, the movie New Jack City. And he was trained by a wrestler named Ray Candy. That's who, knew, that's who trained New Jack to become a wrestler. And the, the advice that New Jack gave him was, you got to create something that you've never seen before. And New Jack thought that was some fucked up mental shit to tell him, but ultimately it worked. Because that's how New Jack started to create this character. Now, Jim Cornette was the one who discovered New Jack and brought him into Smoky Mountain Wrestling because he needed heels to appeal to the Atlanta area. Because, you know, Smoky Mountain, for the most part, was based in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where its home base was. But they also traveled to other places, and he wanted to bring in some heels to come into the Atlanta area. So New Jack was working phenomenally as a heel and brought him in. And his promos were fast and got people riled up. He basically said, if Eddie Murphy was a heel wrestler, uh, he would have been New Jack because of the way he talked and his delivery. Um, you know, even though Eddie Murphy probably had different style of, you know, talking than New Jack did, they were somewhat similar in that. Granted, the content was way different because Eddie Murphy was a comedian. So he wasn't trying to say, you know, motherfucker in a violent way. It was mostly meant to be funny and get you to laugh. Um, but anyway, he would dress like the NWA hip-hop group. That was their gimmick. They dressed like they were in the NWA. And Jim basically uh, gave the marching orders because he never really told New Jack what to say because he can't write for New Jack. He basically gave him bullet points of what he wanted. And basically, he, when New Jack would cut a promo, his mindset was, go make white people mad. That was basically what he said. Piss off white people. That's what they wanted New Jack to do. And that's what New Jack did. And he brought in his tag team partner, Mustafa Saeed. And, that, and they were a tag team. And they didn't really have a tag team name, so Jim Cornette came up with their name, which was the Gangsters. Now, the only difference is Jim Cornette said Gangsters, but New Jack suggested Gangstas. Just put the A-S at the end. So Because they were coming up with different names and couldn't come up with anything. So uh, Jim Cornette said, how about the Gangsters? New Jack said, I like it, but how about the gangstas? He says, I love that. 
And that's how they went with it. So they became the gangsters. And they were basically angry black men who said things that black people wanted to say but couldn't to white men. Like black people who didn't say anything because they were either scared or didn't want to lose their jobs or, you know, people who had to be nice in society. New Jack was like, everything black people secretly want to say to white people but don't because uh, they don't want to fuck up their jobs or their money, New Jack would basically say that. And D'Lo Brown was the manager of the group, but he was basically the bump guy. So that way, New Jack and Mustafa would look tough. They would always dominate, so you would never knock them on their ass, but you could beat up D'Lo to keep the rivalry going. So sometimes they would try to beat up New Jack and Mustafa, but they would just over- New Jack and Mustafa would overpower them, so they would like duck out of the ring. D'Lo would be left by himself, and the baby faces could just beat the shit out of D'Lo, and that way, that's how they would you know, keep the rivalry going. That's how they would get the upper hand. They would just beat the fuck out of D'Lo. And basically, um, they would keep their heat and their dominance, but also, you gotta keep in mind, a lot of other crazy stuff was happening as well. And New Jack basically would cut the most insane promos, for example, like this. You wish I was like some old, some old watermelon. Chicken bone sucking black folks. So, yeah, <laughs> that was the example of the type of promos they would cut. It's stuff like that, like with the chicken and the watermelon, just basically pissing off white people, trying to make, trying to get them as angry as possible. And he was very, very good at that. Now, apparently, Mustafa, you see how crazy he looks in the video. It's because apparently he used to smoke pencil shavings and mix them in with his weed. And he wanted everyone to try it, and nobody would fucking do it. And even New Jack said, it's going to fuck up your head one day. He goes, no, nah, man, it's getting me high. It's really good. And one night, Mustafa got arrested by the cops, and while they were straining him, he said, he's like, don't fuck me. Y'all know you want to fuck me. And New Jack's like, what the? F- what are you talking about? He goes, they want to fuck me, man. Everybody want to fuck me. And they, because Mustafa was off on, was, went mentally fucking crazy because he was high on fucking pencil shavings. Even Sandman was like, I'm not fucking doing that. If Sandman thinks something's fucked up, something's fucked up. Because he done everything, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) But anyway, um, you know, so they would do all that other stuff. And then there was another racial moment that they had that's in this clip. And I'll let you guys take a look at this because um, this involves New Jack with a baby doll with a rope around his neck because he couldn't talk due to a toothache. And they became the hottest villains in Smoky Mountain with this. So I'll have New Jack explain this to y'all as well. Tonight we did a show. I had been to the dentist and my mouth was sore to a point where I couldn't hardly talk. So I said, Mustafa, let's go to Walmart. And I bought a, a white baby dog. And I had a rope tied like a noose. And I walked out to the ring. I got in the middle of the ring and held the baby dog up. And they was like, get the fuck out of here with that shit. New Jack had everyone so mad at the gangsters, Hitler could have walked out through the curtain and he'd have been a baby face. I pissed people the fuck off. And we got so much heat to the point where these motherfuckers was like, we gonna kill them fucking niggas. And they didn't say niggers. We gonna kill them fucking niggers. It got that fucking crazy. And that's the thing. People would say this to them in Tennessee. Keep in mind, this is like the early 90s, early to mid 90s in Smoky Mountain. And apparently even, and that's the thing that New Jack couldn't understand, that he was living in a time where people were still talking like this. Because he grew up in certain places where obviously, you know, racism was still happening, but it wasn't as strong. It wasn't as obvious. Like, there's certain areas in Knoxville, Tennessee that were still heavily fucking racist. Like, heavily racist. Like, the rest of the country... You know, I'm not saying it doesn't have racism, but it's kind of died down. You know, it was kind of like in the 90s. It was still there, but it wasn't as well-known, wasn't as prevalent. It wasn't as much in the news. You had to, like, really go out in public to really see it. And New Jack was seeing this shit a lot down there. So after that, you know, they became the highest of the country. They started feuding with the Rock and Roll Express because Jim Cornette realized, I got to get the tag belts on these guys. They're fucking amazing. So they started a few with the Rock and Roll Express. And they beat down Ricky Morton the way the cops beat down Rodney King. So they did the Rodney King beating in reverse, which Ricky 100% agreed to. And the cops had to escort them out of town because all the white people wanted to attack them with bricks and shit. 
Like, they were outside ready to kill these guys, so the cops had to get them in a car and get them the fuck out of town. Because they were rioting like crazy when they did that. Because that was around the time when the Rodney King beating was all over the news. So New Jack would use that as fuel to get his heat. And the thing is, New Jack didn't even really hate the white people that much. Until they started calling him the N-word, then he got mad. But he was using it, he thought it was funny to just fuck with the white people. Because he was told, make white people mad. And he was still kind of new to the business, so he didn't realize the lines he was crossing till he crossed them. And how they were just booing. Like, he would say things like to Ricky Morton, like, kiss my black ass. And they would get mad about that. Like, it got hectic in that ring every night with those live rounds, with those promos. But, you know, the, new, the, the Rock and Roll Express had to calm New Jack down because he would get mad when the fans would say the N-word and he would chase him through the building. And they had to say, Jack, we selling tickets. Let them say what they want. And they had to understand that by doing that, they were getting their heat. And that's what they needed to do as a heel. You got to get your heat. So if they're screaming that at you, you're doing your job. And then, of course, eventually, the NAACP gets involved with this. And they basically said that they felt that they were doing a horrible misrepresentation of black people. And they were getting offended by New Jack's comments. So now, New Jack's got something to say. Check this out. Some Negroes down in Knoxville call themselves the NAACP or some another. They don't like me. I say it once and I say it again. The hell with them homegrown monkeys. You thought we maybe we was cotton pickers? Wrong. Maybe you thought you had your, some homegrown Negroes? Wrong. Yeah. That's New Jack's response. And everybody in the back is like, what the fuck? And I feel bad for the white guy that's got to interview them. But that was New Jack. That's the shit he would say. And here's the thing. The NAACP still got riled up, still got pissed off, still lost their damn minds. It was some of the most intense shit you would ever see. And that's what he would do. And people in the back were like, fucking nuts. And then... It gets crazier. Listen to this story. Would you say that that period in Smoky Mountain, like, was that fun? No. To have somebody calling you a nigger, I ain't got damn used to that shit. I said, I can't get used to it, and I ain't gonna try to get used to it. The gangsters were literally a microcosm of what was going on in society at that time. And you drop us in the middle of the South, the N-word was freely thrown around like you would say hello. It was uncomfortable, but if they didn't say that, then we weren't touching that nerve. It's a pretty strange concept, yes. I, I want someone to hurl racial slurs at me. I had this little boy come with me one day. He said, can I shake your hand? I stuck my hand out, and he rubbed my arm and looked at his hand. I said, why'd you rub my fucking arm and then look at your hand? He said, I'm sorry. My dad told me, you rub a black person's arm, it'll rub off on you, and you turn black. And I was just like, you little shit. That shit happened. And I've heard New Jack tell that story a few times. The first time I heard him say that was when he made a guest appearance on a Jim Cornette guest booker thing. He kind of crashed the party as a way to kind of make peace and make amends with Jim Cornette. So even, you know, so that was kind of like a funny moment. And he told this story. And it's so fucking crazy that people talk like that. That fascinates the shit out of me. That that people would actually have that mentality or think that way, you know, like it's it makes no fucking logical sense. It sounds fucking stupid. And that's why, you know, when you hear people say stupid racist shit like that, you almost want to laugh at it because it just sounds so fucking stupid. I mean, obviously, it's mean, it's nasty, it's hurt, it's hateful. And I wouldn't have blamed New Jack if he went and punched his dad. Don't punch the kid. Punch the dad. Like, obviously, he's mad because a kid said that, but you don't get mad at the kid. You get mad at the parent. When you see a kid or somebody young at a young age, real young age, acting racist, that's not a real racist. That is a victim of bad upbringing. So that kid's not a racist. That kid's a fucking victim. If I was New Jack, I'd have tracked down his fucking dad and beat his ass. You leave the kid alone, but that dad should have got his ass whipped. For saying some stupid shit like that to your son. That's the worst thing about racism. Is that's why it, that's why racism multiplies. 
Because a racist man or a racist woman can get together, have a fucking baby, and teach them this bullshit. That's what makes it the most disgusting. Is the fact that it gets passed down. That's why it's hard to make it go away. And that's why it may never go away. The best thing you can do is try to minimize it. And this is my biggest belief. Like, you can change the laws of the land, but you can't change people's feelings. That's why it's hard to make racism go away. The only way you can truly make it go away is to fight the system, change the law of the land, get the government to make it happen. You can, you can get the government to change stuff, but some of these racist people, you just got to wait for them to die. <laughs> That's what we, we just got to wait for them to fucking die. And pray to God that after they die, their children are savable. You know, that we can, that you at some point, you can rehabilitate their mind and get them to think differently. That's the only way you're going to beat it. But the problem is, everybody want to try to change the old people. You can't change the old people. It's too late for them. They're old. They're set in their ways. They ain't changing. You got to reach out to the young kids and teach them that it's wrong. You got to let the old people just run free like, like wild coyotes and wait for nature to eventually take its course and wipe them off the face of the earth. The racists, I'm referring to. That's all you can really do. But anyway, that being said, ECW was the wrestling equivalent to grunge music. And New Jack eventually left Smoky Mountain and went to ECW because he had done everything in Smoky Mountain, sadly, and sadly he left on bad terms with Cornette, but New Jack eventually, like I said, made amends with Cornette years later in that video. And Cornette even says in the documentary, he hates the fact that, you know, there was that, that, that they fell out the way they did because at first he was pissed that New Jack was leaving, but at the same time, Cornette now later admits New Jack had done everything there was to do in Smoky Mountain. They had to leave, you know, and they even said, you know, he Jack patched things up. You know, he admitted that Cornette was the one that gave him the shot. Cornette eventually admitted that New Jack was an incredible talent and was valuable asset to Smoky Mountain. And they were able to just become friends and make amends. And now they get along great today. But unfortunately, back then, there was a lot of bad blood. New Jack, of course, fits right in at ECW. Uh, Sandman loved New Jack when he met him. Uh, the locker room was like a family. Paul Heyman was the mastermind. New Jack made himself the most extreme guy in the company. Basically, in this instance, um, you know, Paul Heyman, you know, ran stuff. He did post-production. I think he was living in his mom's house at the point, and he would literally be at his house in front of a TV with a microphone. And this is back in the 90s when technology was great but not that fucking great using VHS tapes and shit to try to get things ready to go for post-production. Like, he was doing shit with technology that's not as good as it is now. Like, I can sit here with way better computer technology and a kick-ass microphone to do this shit. He had to find cheap crap to do that. So, And he did it all the post-production himself. He didn't have a billions of dollars to put behind his company like Ted Turner and Vince McMahon did. But, um, you know, the locker room was very much like a family because they were all for one and one for all, which I think is why it was hard for ECW to really establish stars. Because that's a problem with locker rooms. When you're too much like a family and you're not hungry enough to take a spot, it's hard to build stars that way. Like the Attitude Era, in a way, they were respectful. They were the boys. You know, they joked, they laughed, they kidded around. But at the same time, they all wanted to, they all wanted to be the top guy. And they all were, like, hungry to outdo each other and had competitiveness. So they had respect for each other, but they didn't get too close or be friends until after they all, like, retired and shit. Like, now they can get along. Austin even said, like, he couldn't give Hogan the proper respect he deserved until both men were fully retired from the business. Now Austin can say Hogan's one of the best ever. But in his prime, he had to, dump, he, he had to talk shit. Or kind of throw him to the corner like, oh, he's just a gimmick, you know? Because Austin had a competitive nature about him. He used to call Shawn Michaels a high spot artist. Now he acknowledges him as one of the best ever in the ring. Why? Because he's out of the business and he ain't got to compete no more. But anyway, he left off balconies. He had a shopping cart full of weapons he would bring to the ring. And they would play that, they would play his theme song all the time, you know? Watch your back, it's a hardcore thing in the ghetto. Bam, bam, bam. And they play, I love hearing that song. Like, New Jack to me is one of the most exciting things about ECW. Like, between him and Joel Gertner, those are the only two things about ECW I truly enjoyed. Everything else was just there. 
to me. But anyway, um, they also talk about the fact that New Jack had a fucked up childhood. Uh, his dad hated his mom. Uh, one night when she came home from work, he pulled out a knife and he stabbed her five times because apparently he found out that she had been cheating on him. And she cheated on him a lot. And then uh, this happened in front of the whole family. Like, he didn't give a fuck. A few months later, she tried to leave him, picked up New Jack when he was like five years old, put him in the back seat of the car to leave, and the dad shot her in the back of the leg. Now, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I don't think the mom deserved to be stabbed five times if she cheated. Um, you know, I can understand there being an argument, maybe even like a minor thing, but I don't think she deserved to be stabbed. But if you're going to take someone's kid, I don't blame her for shooting her in the leg. I never understood this, and I hope someday someone will be able to logically explain this to me. I never understood why women got this idea in their heads that when you're going to leave your husband or your boyfriend and y'all have a kid together, that you can just pick up the kid, walk out the door, and expect nothing to happen. Like, no, no man who loves his son or his daughter is going to let you just walk the fuck out the door with him. You're crazy. The only way you're doing that is to bring the cops. That's your best bet to walk out with your husband or your boyfriend's son or daughter and think they're not going to come after you. You got to be high and out your fucking mind. Let me have a kid with someone. They say, I'm going to leave you and take the kid. You can leave. That kid is staying. If I truly loved my son or my daughter, if I have one, I am not letting the woman walk out with my kid. No fucking way. You would have to kill me to do that. You would have to have police with you. And they would have to have their guns fucking drawn and pointed right at my head. And even then, if I have a gun in the house, I, I may bust a cap. That's some bullshit. I never fucking understood that. Someone please explain to me why that's okay. Please. I'd love to hear it. And I would say the same thing, ladies, just so you know. If a man tried to leave you and take the kid with him, I'd say the same damn thing. The only time a woman should ever be allowed to do that is if the man is abusive to the kid. That's the only time. As long as he's a good father, he deserves to have a kid in his life. He may not get along with you, but if he's doing right by the kid all the time, he deserves to be a dad. That is some bullshit. But anyway. On November 23rd, 1996, the mass transit incident took place. The kid, Eric Kulas, who was the mass transit, he had like a, his, his bus driver uniform on as, a, as, a, as his outfit. I don't know if he was a legit bus driver or not. I can't remember. He told everyone he was 21, but in reality, he was 17. So the motherfucker lied about his age. Uh, the kid, and, I guess, and he had a midget wrestler with him named Tiny the Terrible. Now, Tiny the Terrible was on an episode of Jerry Springer called Invasion of the Little People. Because uh, he is a little person, a.k.a. Midget. And he apparently was famous from that. Like, he apparently got a lot of pussy from being on that show. And, you know, that was one of his biggest claims to fame for many years. Even to this day, people would be like, oh, you were on Springer. So, like that. Um, and he was an untrained teenager. Uh, Eric Kulas, not Tiny the Terrible. Tiny the Terrible was a trained midget wrestler. And he substituted for Axel Rotten because he had because of a family emergency. Apparently he had a death in the family. And Axel Rotten was supposed to team up with Devon Dudley to take on the gangsters. But instead, it ended up being Eric Kulas. They decided to team him up with Devon in the match. And Eric went up to New Jack and said he wanted to get some offense in. And he wanted to do a backdrop out of the ring. He wanted to put New Jack through a table. And he said, fuck no. Because that's one of the most disrespectful things you can do in wrestling. You don't go up to a veteran and tell him what you want to do in the ring. Whoever the veteran is, they dictate what happens in that ring. Fact. Fact. If, you are, if you've been in the business for two years and, a, and you're wrestling a guy who's been in the business for 10, the 10-year veteran dictates the match. Now, if that veteran asks you what you want to do in the ring, or what kind of moves you got, then and only then are you allowed to speak up. Outside of that, you keep your fucking mouth shut, and you do what the fuck the veteran tells you to do. It was a pecking order, and in the business, you respect it. If you want the respect of the boys. 
And there are a lot of wrestlers who don't have that respect. And those wrestlers don't belong in the fucking business. One in particular has that philosophy. And that's why I don't like him. Bro. Anyway. So. Eric wanted to get some juice. Which for those of you who don't know means uh, bleeding. There's juice. There's It's gig. Color. That means bleeding. He wants to bleed. And, and um, Jack was so pissed off, he agreed to give him color and said he didn't want to kill him, but he wanted him to be close to death because he was pissed at the way he was behaving. So they threw Devon out of the ring to kind of get him out of the way, and Jack beat the piss out of this kid with everything he could find. Then he grabbed a surgical scaffold that he had taped to a stick. It was about that long. And he stuck him in the forehead, and nothing was happening. So he just kind of sliced him, and he started bleeding uncontrollably, like it was coming out in pints. Mustafa then slammed him and damn near dropped him on his fucking head. New Jack came out the top rope with a chair and landed on his face. And then after the match, he cut a promo and said, I hope this fat piece of shit bleeds to fucking death because I don't give a fuck. And he had his foot right on his belly, his big fat belly. And Jack was also high at the time. He was doing coke in the back before the match, but he did that every night. He then, Eric Kulas throws up defiant middle fingers as he's being wheeled out of the building. His father lashed out at New Jack and security held him back. And that's when this happened. Did Eric's father say stuff to you? He was just calling me a nigger. He's like, you fucking nigger, you stabbed my son, you goddamn nigger. You know, we was off camera then and all base was off. I'd have killed that old man. They so, yeah. That's how crazy this got. Like, he's literally screaming, he's 17! Where's the fucking ref? And the ref wasn't stopping the match. So, Eric ended up getting 50 stitches in his head. And he said he never wants to get in the ring again. That was his last time ever wrestling. And he became depressed after all of this. And New Jack got charged with assault and battery. And this event exposed the business of hardcore wrestling. So ECW, nobody really cared about it back then because... First of all, nobody really gives a shit about pro wrestling in general in the mainstream. But also, the only when you, people talk about wrestling, the only thing they know is WWF, WWE. They don't know nothing else. So nobody knew shit about ECW, really, in the mainstream until the, it is now called the mass transit incident. So the jury was basically a bunch of white women and an 80-year-old black man that was constantly falling asleep. And New Jack was like... You know, dude, you got to wake up. You're my savior at this point. He's thinking the white people are going to condemn him, but that one black guy could get him off. And in a way, that did happen because of what you're about to see here. They had Paul E. on the stand. The DA asked him, what did Mr. Kulaz call Jerome Young? But he was like, he called him the N-word. The DA said, for the record, Say it. Paulie looked at me. He said, Jack, I'm sorry. He said, he called him a nigger. The old juror, the, the black dude, he said, he was like, and the white woman was like, oh. I was laughing so hard. I sleep down. I was like, oh, he's not to do that. <laughs> and he was working the motherfuckers. I mean, he was working the shit out of the goddamn, the judge, the DA, the fucking jurors. He did what he don't want to do best at work, and that's what he did. He was, he, he was working. When the jury learns Eric lied about his age and experience, the balance shifts in New Jack's favor. They deliberated for that day, came back the next day. They found me not guilty. And in there, he was found not guilty. And <laughs> that's how they did it, because they found he lied about his age. Then that moment, the, obviously the black guy's paying attention now, because he said, oh, you call him the N-word? And like I said, that's the quickest way to get a black person on your side is say, oh, he called a black person the N-word. We now on the same team. That's how powerful that word is. It, bring, it, gets, it makes black people mad who aren't even involved in the altercation, which on a personal level never made sense to me, but I ain't going to question it. That's just, it, it is what it is. Or as New Jack would say, it is what the fuck it is. But anyway. So after that, uh, Tiny the Terrible ended up in WWE during the Attitude Era because New Jack said he would take care of him if he testified on his behalf, which he did because him and Eric weren't friends at that point because his dad almost didn't give them a ride 
to the hospital or whatever, even though they all came in a car together because of what happened in the ring. Um, the fa now, afterwards, the family tries to sue him in civil court after they lose the criminal case. But then Eric dies from complications from gastric bypass surgery. And New Jack didn't care that he died. So basically, after a certain point, the case gets thrown out. And obviously, Eric died from those gastric bypass com complications. So New Jack's found not guilty. So he goes back to ECW. He's pushing the envelope. He starts doing cocaine in the locker room every night. And then at one point, New Jack fractured his skull after a match with Vic Grimes at an ECW pay-per-view where he botched a fall off the balcony. Because basically, they were going to go off this 20-foot balcony off a scaffold. Sorry, a scaffold. And New Jack was late to the show because it was snowing. So he asked Vic, did you check the scaffold? He said, yeah. He says, it's safe. Yeah. He said, all right. So they're live on pay-per-view. I think it was the Living Dangerously 2000 pay-per-view. You want to see on the network. Um, or Peacock at the time you're watching this. Now that I think about it, uh, the Peacock's coming out uh, by now. At least by the time you're hearing this, the Peacock thing's already fucking happened. So you, if you got a Peacock account, you can go see this. Um, unless you're watching this outside the United States, in which case, stay on the network. But anyway, they're climbing up this, you know, they go up the scaffold. All of a sudden, Vic Grimes chickens out. He's like, Jack, it's too high. I don't want to go. He's like, we already up here. We got to go. So we go on three. So they do a poll. He's, he's still buzzing down. Vic does this flip, lands on top of New Jack's head, and he fractures his skull, breaks his leg, has permanent insomnia, blindness in his right eye to this day, can't see out of it. And New Jack ends up being out for revenge. So he's home for almost a year recovering. And he wrestles Vic Grimes again at an XPW event. And, you know, Vic tries to apologize. But he says, motherfucker, you didn't even call me to see if I was okay. Which is one of the ultimate sins in wrestling. It's Now look, there are times in wrestling where things go wrong. Accidents happen. There are times where you end up hurting somebody and you don't intentionally mean to do it. But guess what? You still owe it to the other person to say, I fucked up, I'm sorry. Or how are you doing? Or if you can help, help if you can. But ultimately, you don't have to necessarily have to help them, but at least say, hey, I'm sorry. Now, if the person doesn't want to accept your apology, that's on them. But the fact that you at least made one and it was sincere, it's got to be sincere, is all that matters. So they go up the top of this 40-foot scaffold, and New Jack bought a stun gun. And he basically tases the shit out of Vic Grimes while on top of this 40-foot scaffold, like 40 feet off the ground. And he's like, Jack, I can't feel my legs. And he says, you ain't going to need them. And he goes, bombs away, and throws him off the fucking scaffold. Now, they had 12 tables. Stacked on top of each other. Vic Grimes was supposed to go through those 12 tables and kind of fall down. So he would get hurt, but not as bad because it would cushion the fall. Well, New Jack wanted to give Vic a receipt for fracturing his skull. So he throws him past the tables. He clips one table. He hits the ropes and falls back in the ring. He was that close to hitting the floor. And if Vic Grimes had hit the floor, he would have died. New Jack even says he wanted to throw him out of the ring. He wanted to land out of the ring, but he didn't throw him hard enough. And he climbs down the scaffold, walks over to his body and says, now we even, you fuck, and walks off. But here's the crazy part. Not only the fact that he hit the roads and fell back in the ring, the only injury Vic Grimes suffered from that was a dislocated ankle. That was it. Other than that, Vic was okay. That's fucking crazy that he survived this fall. Because New Jack wanted to kill him. He straight up wanted to kill Vic Grimes that night. He's pit. The only thing that New Jack's mad about the most is the fact that he didn't die. If he had died, that would have been a victory for New Jack. So don't piss Jack off because the fight's not over until he says it's over. And then we get to another incident in 2003 where he wrestles 72-year-old Gypsy Joe who says he is impervious to pain. So Joe's not Jack and says, listen to me out there, kid. I can teach you a lot. And Jack got offended because this man's trying to say, I can teach you. Keep in mind, this is, again, this is somebody in the business talking to a legendary veteran and trying to say, I can teach you. Motherfucker, this is new Jack. You're a 72-year-old on the fucking indies 
in a show that had 30 people at best, okay? You don't know shit, Gypsy Joe. Trying to say I can teach New Jack. Motherfucker, that's a legend. Again, the respect factor has to be in place. You can teach New Jack. Motherfucker, you wish you could draw money like New Jack. So then, because his gimmick is impervious to pain, every time Joe hits him, he doesn't want to sell. So eventually, Jack starts getting violent, and this happens. They found me not guilty. So then, I got, they listened to these fans. Go home, nigger. Fucking nigger. And then, I was pissed. I started beating Joe like that motherfucker owed me money. I beat the shit out of him. Outside the ring, I got a bat. They had bought while I wrapped around him. They hit him in the head like three times. Jack just said, fuck this old man. I threw a row of chairs on him, and they got loud. Go home, nigger, you fucking nigger. And dude, the more they said it, the more pissed off I got. And I beat the shit out of a 100-year-old man. Wish the match never should have happened in the first place. Well, there you have it, folks. That's <laughs> everything you need to see there regarding the uh, racist compilation of New Jack. But, yeah, man, that shit happened. And I guess in a way, since New Jack didn't want to beat up all the fans, he took all his anger out on Gypsy Joe, who was already pissing him off. And, you know, that's the thing. New Jack didn't take any shit. And there's cases where some people think he went over the line. Me personally, I think New Jack, people offended him, crossed the line, and he fucking beat their ass. So anyway, New Jack was a liability. He was too controversial, which is why he never made it into WWE. They feared lawsuits, bad publicity, and wrestlers getting seriously hurt intentionally by New Jack. New Jack works for indie companies that can barely draw a crowd. And it's hard to do. Um, then we meet this guy, MWW, who is a musician, but is now a former wrestler and promoter for Thunder Wrestling Federation. Uh, William Jason Lane, a.k.a. Hunter Red, worked with New Jack in that promotion. He said, let's talk about the match. New Jay says we can go in the back. He said, I want to talk about it now. He said, we'll go in the back. Because that's where you go to lay out a match. You don't do it out in public where people can see it. You go in the back and you talk about it. I see it happen all the time. So, basically, New Jack starts laying out what they're going to do. Halfway through, Red gets up and leaves and says, all right, whatever you want to do, fuck it. And he leaves. So, Jack gets frustrated. He had this Wolverine claw that had three blades on them. One of the blades broke off. He was snorting coke and drinking vodka in the locker room. So he had the blade, that one blade that broke off, he put it in his pocket. Red starts punching New Jack, but he's potatoing him, which means he's hitting him for real. So New Jack gets him in the front line and says to him, you trying to handle me? You really trying to handle me? And then New Jack takes out this blade and stabs him in the back. Literally in the back, nine times he stabs this guy. And uh, just apparently... Now he's in jail again, or about to go to jail again. Now, Cornette says, if wrestlers agree to stuff beforehand that happens in the ring, then they're working together regardless of what's happening. But if they don't agree to what's happening and someone call, and someone does something unexpected, that's assault. Obviously, um, Hunter Red did not agree to be stabbed nine times. That's clearly assault. So New Jack gets arrested. The cops ask him, why does he hate white people? Which is fucking offensive and inappropriate. It had nothing to do with him hating white people in that moment. And if you want to ask New Jack why he hates white people, if he had an answer, it would probably be, um, because they keep calling me the N-word. I think that's a reason to hate white people. Fucking dumbass cops. Anyway, eventually Red visits New Jack while he's in jail. And Red agrees to drop the charges if they go on the road together and make an angle out of this. He said, let's do the whole Florida circuit where it's like, I'm out for revenge and I'm searching for New Jack. And they figure they can make money with this. Because... Let's be honest, Hunter Red ain't making much money as a wrestler because, like I said, they're barely drawing crowds in that fucking federation, if it's even still around, which it probably ain't. But New Jack says, you have to drop the charges, and I'll do it. So Red agrees, he drops the charges, but then New Jack packs his stuff in storage and left the state of Florida and never spoke to him again. So basically, New Jack lied to him. They never did the angle. And then, at one point, his mom called him up, because apparently his mom's still alive. He said... 
He should be ashamed of himself. And, she, and he mentioned that she never supported his wrestling career. And he said, bitch, I got action figures of me in Toys R Us. How many fucking friends, sons you know got action figures of themselves at Toys R Us? Like, New Jack's a fucking star, but his mom still never supported his career. And you get parents like that sometimes, where you're, you reach a level of fame, a level of success, but your parents still don't support what you do. And that's heartbreaking for any kid. They'll never admit it, but it is. Now, his dad died when he was five years old uh, of a heart attack. And he remembers the fucked up shit he did. He grew up in a fucked up environment, which is why he is fucked up now. And they mentioned that Eric Kulas' family uh, refused to take part in this documentary because they, they don't want to talk about this. It's too depressing for them. Uh, New Jack basically became his gimmick. Jerome Young doesn't exist anymore if he ever did. And they asked him what the end of a New Jack movie would be. And he said it would be him in a wheelchair snorting coke. And that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, concludes the documentary, The Life and Crimes of New Jack. Uh, like I said, this was a crazy episode. You saw a couple clips of it um, from that compilation, but that was just the moments that uh, had racism in it. I highly recommend you watch the rest of it. Um, because you guys will definitely enjoy it, definitely get a kick out of it. It's very entertaining, and it talks about one of the craziest, greatest, pioneering wrestlers of all time. A guy who never made it to WWE, was never in WCW, almost got an opportunity when Master P was doing the filthy, was doing the feud with the filthy animals against the West Texas Rednecks, but Kevin Nash put the kibosh on that because he was on the booking committee at the time. But... He was in ECW, Smoky Mountain, worked the indie circuit, and is still considered one of the greatest of all time and a legend in wrestling. And like I said, if you are somebody that aspires to be a hardcore wrestler, New Jack is the guy you want to watch. And <laughs> New Jack said that, you know, once his uh, ankle heals up, he said this in the interview with Vlad Entertainment, he may or may not get back in the ring. And who knows, maybe one day we'll see him again in UCW because apparently he wrestled for UCW a few times, but that was long before I joined the promotion. But who knows? Maybe we can get New Jack to come in and uh, maybe wrestle for the hardcore title or be the hardcore champion. I mean, someone's got to give Barbarian a run for their money. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to wrap this up right now. Uh, thank you guys for uh, checking this video out. Make sure you guys tune in next week. We're going to have another great episode for you guys as we're going to be discussing the Brawl for All. That's right. The boxing tournament from the Attitude Era. That A lot of good stories about that. And we'll get into the Brawl for All next week. And I can't wait to share it with you guys. And uh, So for now, I'm going to ask you guys to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to be notified so you never miss another episode of Boochcast Reviews, Dark Side of the Ring, as well as other additional Boochcast YouTube content. Make sure you're following us on all of our social media platforms. The links are down in the description box. I'll talk to you guys next week. Until then, pizza, baby!